Okay, I think most people are back, so let's go ahead and resume. Our next speaker is Mark Changizi from 2AI Labs in Idaho in the United States, and he will be talking to us about nature, harnessing in writing, and speech and music, but apparently not grammar. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, um, all right, so let me, let me, there's just half an hour, so I'm just gonna give you a, a, both the big picture of what I'm trying to do with these series of research directions and how I came into it, and then give you just a, a, little, a little taste of, of the research in writing and, and, and speech, and then maybe hint at, at, at it for music. So the approach that, you know, one way to, uh, to, to make a cartoon out of the dichotomies is that you can have um, instincts for some of these sorts of things, whether it's uh, speech or music or, 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 or reading, which we know isn't the case. Um, or, or you could potentially, another hypothesis is that we're just, we evolved compared to the other apes to be incredibly good learners, the kinds of things that AI is trying to build. We're just this, this we have something that, that the other apes don't. Um, and then th there's an alternative view, uh, and it's, it's a cultural selection sort of view. And it's, it's not that these sorts of powers are, are due to instincts, and it's not that we just learn willy-nilly new sorts of things. And it's that cultural evolution has instead shaped these things to be well, um, or well structured for the brain. And that's an old idea, the idea that cultural selection could do this. And it's, then it's, it's neither an instinct per se, and it's neither invented or learned per se. It's really something that culture has invented to tap in or harness an instinct um, really well. But so what I'm trying to do here is really get specific about what culture's trick could be. In, in a hypothesis or in a, in a cultural evolution kind of um, framework. So um, the kind of viewpoint that I'm going to have is, is this. Um, let me just pop over here. So we have these three kinds of powers that, uh, these capabilities that we have that we prize um, compared, yes, compared to what the other apes <laughs> have. I think everybody left their coffee over there in there. Oh, yeah. um, and so the idea is that could it be, could there be something that all of us apes had well before, well before we had these sorts of things, such that these things tap into those? Um, could it be that these are, have been culturally selected to mimic some sort of structure out in nature, such that uh, it thereby transforms mechanisms in your brain that were for one thing and turns it into a reading machine? So that was the way this research started or transforms some auditory recognition capability and turns it into a speech processing machine. So the, the, real, the, the, the method that I'm approaching is to really look out in nature at very fundamental things. So the kinds of things I'm going to point to aren't the Serengeti or the Savannah or some really peculiar things. It's just, just going to be any three-dimensional environment with opaque objects strewn about is going to be the kind of environment that has the structure that you need to explain the kinds of structure that you find in writing. Um, and uh, and for, uh, for speech, it turns out that solid object events, the main kind of sound category for terrestrial animals, has a lot more structure than you might realize. Just solid objects has a grammar of its own. And if you can try to begin to work that out, you can say, holy crap, it sounds, it has a lot of the beginning characteristics that you find in speech. Just what you'd expect if culture was trying to shape the sounds of speech to be just the sort of thing that we were already good at processing. And in the case of music, another kind of auditory stimulus, the idea is that um, whereas solid objects are a very sterile kind of sound, um, the sounds of human movers, that is all animals have recognition systems for other, other of their own kind, kind specifics, and it would be striking if we didn't have recogn auditory recognition mechanisms that are cap allow us to process the sounds of humans moving in our midst, their emotions, their behaviors, their direction, their proximity, and so forth. Could it be that music, in fact, is trying, trying, culturally evolved to sound like this sort of structure. Right. So um, where, where I began in this, um, before I ever, ever thought about trying to do this for speech or music, was in the case of, of writing or reading. And what's fun about um, you know, one of these standard alien uh, examples, if aliens were to come down to Earth and see the extent to which we read and how quickly we read, um, they might wonder whether we, in fact, evolved to read. Um, we. Uh, are often able to read books about how to somersault before we're able to do typical monkey bar sorts of behavior. Um, uh, it, it, they, they learn about twice the age that they can process um, uh, language, uh, spoken language, but then again, they're being uh, 
writing is being thrown at them inordinately less than, it's being, than speech is being thrown at them. And once we're up and running, um, it's, it, we even have uh, areas that seem to be devoted uh, to reading, which of course we, we know we can't, they can't be devoted to reading um, in, in the instinct sense. So if, if we can come to have a, almost have many of the hallmarks of an instinct for reading, and when we know we didn't uh, evolve to read, because it's only several thousand years old, and most of us have ancestors one or two generations back that didn't read. Um, all of our ancestors probably didn't read. Ancestors didn't read just one, two or three generations back. Um, could it be that whatever the trick is that got us to do this uh, amazing capability also applies to the other? So let me just run through the, the short story for, for how I think cultural evolution shaped the structure of writing to be good for our brain. Um, so in the case of writing, my argument is gonna, is gonna be that the, there's just, in a terrestrial environments, there's a very fundamental kind of structure that you get from opaque objects strewn about. If you were an animal that lived in the ocean and there are semi-transparent, cloudy stuff, it's gonna be different, and I'll, I'll mention that in a second. But for opaque worlds like ours, in terrestrial environments, you're gonna get some fairly regular um, uh, kinds of structure. So, and, and of course, what you'd like is for the words, the word levels, meanings, to look like the kind of things, the kinds of stimuli that meant object level meanings out in the world. That would be, the, that would be what you'd like, ideally. And you find that roughly in non-linguistic signs. They may not always look like anything in particular. And in logographic signs, not anything in particular. But they have the vague structure of the kinds of simple drawings that people draw. The more difficult thing, and so by virtue of doing so, if this is a cartoon of your ventral stream, instead of 15-ish levels, we have three. This is a stand-in for nature. The idea is you know, you're dealing with lower level, uh, higher level, uh, you know, broader uh, object, parts of the objects as you go up. Then drawings that people would do you know, get soaked up this ventral stream very well, non-linguistic signs, local graphic symbols. They all work well on this same uh, ventral stream. The difficulties, uh, the biggest difficulty comes in phonemic writing like ours where you have design that is occurring at the level of the letter. You can't design at the level of the whole word anymore. You have to design at the level of the letter and they're standing for sounds of, uh, the, the sounds of speech or, 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 or related to the sounds of speech. But the next best thing is if you, if letters, look like, they need to look like subwords. So to make words like objects, um, uh, we need to make letters look like subobjects or the junctions within objects is the idea. So if you'd like your entire word to have broadly the structure of an object, you want your letters, which are subwords, to have broadly the structure of subobjects. And for since the 1960s, computational vision folk have pieced together the kinds of junctions that are the substructures of the stimuli that make up objects, and they'd worked these things out a long time ago, the things like T-junctions and L-junctions and Y-junctions. So, as we'll see, um, letters have the size of natural junctions. In fact, this is, there was another research direction that I had done before this that led into this, uh, but more, much more specifically, they have the kinds of shapes. In terms of the size, um, uh, by size, I just mean the number of strokes per character, and when you look at 115 uh, writing systems over history and you just plot as a function of the number of characters in the writing system, what's the average number of strokes per character? You end up with this, these uh, are the numerals systems, but amongst the characters, despite uh, an order of, a little bit more than an order of magnitude of variability in the number of characters, they seem to like, and this is just a binned version of this, they like to have three strokes per character. Um, and again, you're cut there, there's more and more characters that they have. Another way to get more and more characters would be to have more and more strokes per character. That's another way to give you the common plural explosion you need. But instead, they come up with um, more and more stroke types, and they keep the number of strokes per character roughly the same. Um, again, this isn't particularly uh, great evidence for this, this particular letters are shaped like nature hype, but this is what led into it. I said, it struck me at the time. I said, well, three, you know, could it be that this, you know, because most of these junctions from computational vision are, are of length three, and I started to pose the hypothesis, could it be that they're not just of the right size, but they're the right shape? So. Visual signs generally are built out of natural junctions. So let's see. What I, what I mean by shape here is this notion of shape, a topological shape. So LTs and Xs really stand for whole infinite classes of geometries that share, in the case of Ls, two contours that meet at their tips. T junctions, one contour meets in the middle of another contour and Xs cross. And this is, was my periodic table of dif distinct topological shapes. Again, these are just stand-ins for uh, you know, just one uh, uh, form that represents a whole class. 
So the question is, let me give you some, uh, so well, here's the first, just the data of what you find in uh, Chinese is the red, and, and amongst non-linguistic symbols, you end up with that green, and then uh, uh, the one, the real target one here that we're interested in, in the way that I'm posing this today, is the black one, which is non-logographic writing. Um, and broadly, you see that there's a lot of strong tendencies here, but I, and we'll get, I, I'm not, we're going to get back to a few of those tendencies in a minute. But the question is why, and uh, this is not a tautology. I'm going to skip some of these details today. It doesn't get, get from random lines. You can argue that this is probably for vision, not motor, because when you look at trademark symbols, which are selected for the eye but not the hand, um, you get the same sort of pattern. But when you look at uh, shorthand uh, symbols selected for motor get, uh, versus visual, they don't uh, follow this. If you look at um, number, uh, measures of visual stimulus complexity, it tends to correlate fairly well. Measures of motor complexity do not correlate very well. So it's probably something vision-oriented that drives this. And in particular, the hypothesis is, is, is it because the world, is in fact ha does, the world, in fact, has those structures? So, I mean, does, does, do letters, in fact, look like nature? So quick intuition pumps here. Amongst these three junction types that have just two contours, um, T's, T's and L's are common. T's happen whenever some contour goes behind a contour, and L's happen on corners all over the place. X's, however, are rare. They can happen with tr semi-transparent objects, but that's fairly rare in a terrestrial environment. Um, another nice class of things to look at are these four cousins. They each have three contours. They each have two T's within it. And remember, T's happen when there's partial occlusion, when there's an object that goes behind an object. One of these is not like the others. I'll leave this as an exercise. If you try to play games with objects in front of objects to get you that junction, you can't get this. So it's rare in the natural world for these structural kinds of reasons. And again, amongst these fellows here, it roughly takes more and more coincidental alignments of, of objects to make it happen, which means it roughly gets rarer. So that's intuition pumps. But when you actually take data from a variety of different kinds of scenes, including this last scene, last category, which is not natural at all, they're just basically opaque three-dimensional environments with opaque objects turned about, um, you end up with, first of all, L's are more common than T's and X's. Amongst these four cousins, this one is the weirdly rare one. And amongst these guys, it gets roughly rare as you move to the right. Question is, does this, do you also find this in writing? We already saw the writing thing earlier. Now all I've done is just overlap the average of the photographic data from the previous page with the dotted red, which is the visual sign data from before. And you see this very strong similarity. Amongst, you see that L's and T's are more common than X's. The weird people, uh, weird one here, again, for writing, um, is also the weird one in nature. Uh, and you see this very strong uh, 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 tendency to match. Um, and again, these are things on the page. They don't need to match us at all. These are not three-dimensional objects out in space projecting toward an eye. They're just stuck flat on the page. Okay. So by virtue of doing this, um, you now you can get this new category, this, this phonemic writing or non-logographic writing systems to fit like a glove, or you know, kind of fit like a glove, this ventral stream, this object recognition um, cortex that ne never evolved to do this. So that's, that's the kind of trick that's a really good trick if culture can carry this off. Because now, um, you never we never had to evolve to be readers, luckily. Um, it, it turned out with the right making of letters and what writing looked like, um, you could just exploit old areas. <laughs> really? <laughs> I'm lucky. Sometimes it doesn't pop up and tell you. It's just below uh, and just, it just kills you. Uh, four hours. Kill screen. Um, all right. So the story for speech. Um, now, of course, for writing, this isn't particularly controversial in the sense that no one ever thought that we evolved um, to have uh, a, a reading instinct. But here, of course, there's many other options to, to suggest. And so when I began to wonder, I mean, if, if in just several thousand years, and even much shorter, really, because for the most part, cultural evolution probably wasn't doing very much work on writing for the longest time. It was just a few accountants and a few monks sitting around. And no one, it wasn't really doing much. So in a very short period of time, several hundred years, or, I mean, it can get as optimized as it is to pervade our brains and lives as much as it is. You can imagine speech if it's been around 100,000 years or 200,000 years and dynamically uh, shifting and evolving much more uh, uh, quickly. Um, perhaps that it's much more attuned to our auditory system, some aspect of our auditory system, than writing is um, to our visual system. But what on earth could it be that our auditory system was for before speech? And I think many of us have really bad intuitions about this. Most of the time, when you look at papers in neurobiology about the kinds of natural auditory stimuli, invariably they throw up bird songs and waves and wind and all this other kinds of stuff 
which aren't, in my opinion, natural at all in the sense that relevant to our, our, eco our existence. Um, the things that matter in a terrestrial environment, we hear so often and so commonly that we just don't even notice it because it just flies below the radar and it just sounds like this, you know, just right? And when you sit still, you'll hear these kinds of sounds all the time. You know what it is. You say, oh, that was, that was not a coffee mug. You're not, maybe you didn't know it was exactly that. But you know it wasn't a coffee mug. It kind of hit, hit, and then it slid. And the basis of the ring, very short ring in this case, that, that it, it, it's a periodic vibrations of the material which, which decays both the op And you also know that it landed on some kind of table-ish, fake wood sort of thing, as opposed to this, right? That sounds fundamentally different, let's pretend. And uh, <laughs> so all of these things are, you're hearing at all times. And so after a few months, I got all grasshopper about this. And I realized, oh yeah, it's, it's, it, this, is, this is what ears are for. And of course, ears, that is my first intuition, was the only, the only way that I use my ears is to listen to other people talk, which of course is crazy because all of the animals have ears. But that's how bad I think many of our intuitions are about auditory system is because it's, it, we just don't um, think about it. So as, I, as I, I started to wonder what kinds of structure do solid object events have? Um, and so I'm just going to go through... Um, uh, a few of the kind, uh, uh, just sort of two stories here uh, about it. And the, and the first thing that struck me, which is really just motivation to continue onward, was that, well, they're basically built out of hits, you know, just what I, hits, and then you have slides. This is when one has an extended period of, of sliding against the other. And then you have uh, rings. That's when one or the other object, and both, just periodically vibrate. That's pretty much it. There's a little bit more nuances, as I discuss in the book. Um, but that's pretty much it. Uh, and they're fundamentally different kinds of categories, as, especially this one, as I'll get to in just a second. But the first similarity that you find to, to, to speech and phonology was just like, well, you know, the, the, at the basic level, the three, some, the three biggest categories of speech sounds are plosives and golly, they, they sound like hits. You know? and, and then you've got fricatives, they sound like slides. And then you've got all the sonorants and the vowels, and they sound just kind of like rings, like ringing things, right? And so I started, this is what then propelled me to start looking to see if we can work out more grammatical or structure in the sounds of solid object events to say, all right, here's some genuine regularity on the basis of the energy or the, or some, I'll, t I'll give you one other story in a minute. Do you also find this across uh, uh, speech, and at least in the language that I was able to get data for? Um, so uh, before mentioning, I'll, I'll mention this story first. If you wanted to go to the very next level, so if you've got atoms, and there's the similarity, rough similarity to the kinds of three basic categories of, of phonemes. Um, well, th at the next level, think about how these hit slides and rings interact. Um, rings are a different animal than hits and slides. Hits and slides are interactions. They're involving one object touching another. Um, rings happen for free whenever objects touch one another. So if you imagine a big, long Rube Goldberg sequence of events, it's really a sequence of hits and slides. Hit, hit, slide, 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 hit, 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 hit. And the rings are happening after each one for free. They're not usually contributing to the actual causality of the event. So you always have an interaction, namely a hit or a ring, I mean a hit or a slide, followed by a ring, a hit or a slide, ring, hit or a slide, ring. Well, this just sounds like syllables, right? You've got basically the CV kind of structure that you find, that's right. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, that's that at the, the next level, at the very simplest level, you, you find uh, the syllabic structure in the sounds of these events. Um, let me uh, just jump to um, one story here. Let's just go through a nice uh, case of rigid, rigidity. Um, what distinguishes, uh, let's start in the case of, of the world. If I have a flat basketball versus if I have a hard pumped up basketball. Think about what the difference is. Uh, if, it's a if it's a hard basketball, then when it hits the ground, it spends very little time in its interaction with the ground before it gets off the ground and it does its steady state periodic vibration. If it's flat, it spends more time. So there's a longer gap between the first hit and the ring if it's a flat basketball. If it's inelastic and squishy, there's a longer uh, 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 gap. So this is the, uh, uh, I'm having mental block, what's it called, the voice, the voice onset? Voice, VOT. Uh, so the idea is, so why should voice onset time, which is this peculiarly short period of time that, that sounds so different, not just to us, but to 
rodents and to birds and other kinds of animals. Why should this matter? Well, the reason that it should matter is because it's a reg ecological regularity among solid objects. It tells you about this. It's one of the many pieces of structure out there that tells you what kind of object it is. And it's something that we know, instinctively know, um, because it's important to understand. Um, well, this is just uh, getting the same kind of thing here. Um, so it's this. So now think about, let's think about the ends of events. Um, when you have a buh, um, or a, uh, you have an explosion, you have a plosive at the beginning of a word. It ex it's basically a little explosion. Yet it's, it's still considered the same kind of sound, even when it's at the end of the word, when you say, you know, ab, or you know, give me the tab, right? If you think about it, that's strange, because one is ab, right? One is just an anti-explosion, and one is an explosion. Why should it be that an auditory system should even remotely consider these things to be the same sort of sound? When one, they're completely the opposite. Whereas we give a big damn about the difference between this little voice onset time, but we don't care about this explosion versus anti-explosion. And the reason is because in real life, there's two ways that you can get a hit. The same ecological event can cause two kinds of things. It can cause an explosion. So imagine that you just hit a, a bell and it rings. But now imagine that it's already ringing. Now if I hit it, I can actually dampen it. So if you've ever played a guitar, you go da 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 da. They'll hit. You know that is when it's ringing. It's, they'll hit it, and that sounds like a hit. Strictly speaking, though, it's not causing a ring at all. It's stopping a ring. You hear it as a hit because hits can stop rings as well as they can start rings. So this is why plosives at the end of the words or unreleased plosives still sound like the same sort of thing because that's what happens in the real world. Now let me catch the tail before I have to finish here. Now, the uh, uh, plosives uh, 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 like b and, and, and p distinguish themselves on the basis of the voice onset time at the beginning of words. But of course, at the end of the words, there is no voice onset time because it's at the end. And there's just an anti-explosion. They just stop. Well, let's think about what the ecology predicts. What's the difference between a rigid object and a non-rigid object in terms of how they hit things and dampen them? So now imagine I've got our bell that's already ringing. And I've got a fleshy hand, and I've got a hard hammer. Which one is going to dampen it more quickly? Well, the, the, the inelastic one, or the squishy one, is going to dampen more quickly than a hard. So the, that is the, the ecological auditory signature of an elastic thing at the end of an event, when it clamps down on a ring, is that it takes longer to clamp it down. And that's, in fact, how these uh, plosives are distinguished at the end of words. When you have tap versus tab, people extend across languages. It's tab versus tap. It's shorter. The way we distinguish at the end is on the basis of that lo how long it is. That's exactly on the, ba the same basis that we use in the ecology of the natural environment. So you find that, again, so at the beginnings of words or at the end of the words, um, in voice and unvoiced, voiced, um, you find the same ecological kind of structure. So what I, the, the, the game here is to have, is to continue to examine the structure of terrestrial environments for uh, visual objects to predict writing, examine all the grammatical subtleties, gr uh, these are qu scare quotes around grammar, grammatical subtleties of solid object events and say, wow, there's all this fine structure there. Um, brains like ours probably evolved to note these things. And can we find these in the structure of speech? And finally, let me just hint now at, um, Oh wait, let me just uh, make, you might worry that look, our mouths are physical object. There's, uh, th we're not making um, sounds by magic, right? So if our mouths are making sounds by virtue of physical object, in some kind of physical way, then isn't it just some tautology that we're making speech sounds that sound like solid object events? But you have to remember, physical objects are filled with lots of sorts of things. There's water, wind, air, fire, all these sorts of things. In fact, your mouth is an air flow mechanism of making sounds. It has huge repertoire, and what it's doing is just making solid object physical events sound, basically hit slides and rings, which is in the tiniest corner of its capability, and it's in fact mimicking those. It's using airflow. It's not that your teeth are chattering to make hits, or you're grinding your teeth, or rubbing. It, it, these are airflow events mimicking these kinds of things, so it's not some kind of tautology. All right, and let me just hint at this music thing, and then we'll be done. Um, this, is, this gets even crazier. Here. So, you know, on the vision side of things, uh, 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 writing looks fairly sterile, mostly. Of course, you can get beautiful typography and all, the thi all these things. But we're not usually interested in staring at the typical letters on the page. Whereas, let's say, uh, um, uh, uh, colors, 
people get really emotional about it. They argue about what colors the wall should be. And I've argued in my research that the reason is because colors are ultimately about humans. Color, our, our color vision evolved and is optimized for seeing the hemoglobin oxygenation modulation of the skin, was one of my research uh, areas. And so ultimately, it's looking at the evocative stuff of, of other humans. And generally, in the arts or anywhere, when you find stimuli that you can't explain and they affect people in some way and they're just getting all gushy about it, probably it's because it looks in some way, um, even though you can't put your finger on it, like humans, because the humans were the biggest source of, of life, death, and sex, and all these things that mattered. Um, you know, uh, so, that's, so when you start looking at music, you say, okay, auditory stimuli, uh, speech sounds like these sterile, solid optic events, but music ain't like that. Music is something we're willing to just pour into our brains all day long and just love to listen to. It's got to be human in some way. And so the qu question was, what could it possibly be? And so the idea was to work out on the basis of this kind of isomorphism is just that, look, in real life, humans have gait. The most fundamental aspect of their gait is you have a beat, and you have all these time-locked banging ganglies on your body. That you get these, your feet scrape the ground along the way, your arms hit. There's all these other kinds of sounds. If you close your eyes, you can hear whether they're skipping or what kinds of, you can actually hear whether they're angry or sad or happy. All of these things that you can tell that, well, I'll get their direction in a moment. So um, you have direction and Doppler shifts. That is the biggest thing in the real world for, for pitch modulations are to the subtle but perceptible Doppler shifts of even fairly slow moving people. And so the idea is that melody, could it be that it has the fundamental uh, pitch, the fun fundamental signature that you find for Doppler shifts of moving things around you. Loudness, the biggest modulations of loudness in the real world, world is just distance because it's an inverse square law. It can just, it, it explodes in terms of its loudness when it's near you. And then tempo um, uh, uh, is, is sort of straightforwardly uh, for speed. So let me just, let me just jump to a couple, uh, a couple things that this kind of thing can explain, as the, and I cover many of these things in the book. But you have to ask yourself, some of the questions that you have to ask yourself are things you never even think to ask. So for example, why does pitch vary quickly in music but not loudness? Right? I could have music that sounded like this. It just goes and then after a while, I switch to a new pitch. Right? That would look crazy. That would be where I'm staying at the same pitch for a long time, and I'm modulating my fortissimos and pianos at all these various levels, and then going to a new pitch. Music is never like that. And the reason music is never like that is the ecological environment is never like that. When movers move around you, um, uh, they change the direction quickly. They can change the direction 90 degrees in just two steps. And we have a lot of data that shows that people typically turn two, in two steps. Um, that means that their, their pitch, you know, when they're coming toward you, it's So they have the lowest pitch when they're moving away, the highest pitch when they're moving toward. So you can, you can get whatever the melodic range is. You can move half that range in just a couple steps. Because um, direction, changes of directions are easy. They don't have to, they can just do two, two steps. Whereas changes in loudness aren't like that. Changes in loudness require that you translate a physical body over space to go from far to near or near to far. It's inherently a slow time scale sort of thing. Um, uh, let's see, I'm just going to do one more and then we're done here. That's, yeah, let me just point out this one. There's two, th um, there's two notions of speed here. When you have a really fast mover, a car moving next to you, it'll be like this. There's a big difference between its top and bottom. And if it was doing dances around you and doing some kind of behavior, it'd be like this. If it's a really slow moving bike or something like this, it'll be. So this distance from the top of the, of the, the highest pitch to the lowest pitch is a measure of how fast that mover is moving. And in melody, that distance between the top and bottom is called the tessitura. And the fact that there's a tessitura at all, that there's this notion of a top and bottom that sometimes it breaks out of, but for the most part, a top and bottom is already something that fits because movers have tessitura. Um, music need not have had tessitura at all, a sensible notion of tessitura. But so one notion of how fast, measure of how fast the musical mover is, because remember this hypothesis here that literally music is a fictional story of a mover moving evocatively in your midst. This is the only kind of reason that could explain why you would spend all day listening to it. How fast it's moving is based on the tessitura width, but also on its tempo. That is the, the number of beats per minute. So we should expect that music that's faster in tempo should end up with a greater pitch range. And this is what this y-axis is measuring. And remember, this is not what the musician wants. This means that as it gets faster, the pianist, and this is these are all data from the piano, the pianist is having to get, what the pianist would like is that it gets smaller and smaller so you can keep his fingers in, in, like this, right? But instead it's getting wider and wider. 
So the idea is, so, so again, th this is the kind of a game here is to see whether you can keep working out the kinds of sounds that people make. And I go through more than 40 of these sorts of, of you know, there's uh, Newton's first law kinds of things. You can characterize what that is for what you, in terms of what humans eat. And then you make predictions across um, uh, tens of thousands of, of pieces of music. All right. Um, man, I don't have time for this. All right. So, so just, to, just to summarize here, um, you know, I, I'm... This is a different kind of proposal that I'd like, and I'm just, the, as, as far as I know, the first that's really tried to work out the grammar of these very fundamental, but not tautological. I mean, um, sea creatures, again, wouldn't care about solid fish that come out and are, you know, jump up on land and they hear us talking, they might go, why are these guys constantly making these solid object event sounds? Um, they're not going to be very good at processing them. They have some other kind of world of, of other kinds of stuff. Um, uh, chimpanzees who are quadrupedal or you know whatever the, the kind of gait that's that they're complicated gait may not like all aspects of human music because it's a fundamentally bipedal one, but they're going to like potentially the Doppler shifts. But these are these are uh, fairly fundamental, but they're not so specific like savanna or, or you know really peculiar things. So their generality allows you to um, make predictions and make theoretical headway on the kinds of patterns and the kinds of structure that you find, and then hopefully see whether you can show that, yeah, more and more of these sorts of structures that we're really good at have that grammar inside it, which, is, which then is an alternative explanation for how we have these capabilities. All right, thank you.